All right, students. I'll be handling the endotracheal intubation portion of the laboratory component. Um, I'm primarily going to focus this more uh, in terms of the procedure uh, rather than uh, more of a lecture component. Again, I'm just trying to give you all a brief overview on some of the indications, complications, contraindications. Uh, I did include some information on some of the medications that are, are used as well uh, during the rapid, uh, what is it, rapid sequence induction. Um, and so I, I will end up uh, just briefly giving you all an, an overview on that, but that is probably something that you, you will learn more during your lecture component and certainly during your own studies. So let's go ahead and begin. Okay, endotracheal intubation. Um, right here, we do have at least a, a quick outline as to what I'm going to be covering, certainly indications, contraindications, complications, uh, a few pearls and pitfalls as well. Um, I'll, I'll discuss a little bit of the models and instruments um, and procedures as well, albeit with models and instruments and procedures, we will actually be performing a uh, demonstration in lab. And so we will have actually a, a video component that we're going to record later on as well. Let's go ahead and continue. Okay, rapid sequence intubation. Be before we actually start talking about the, the actual endotracheal intubation, there's usually something called rapid uh, sequence intubation or, or, or induction. Now, in, in this case, the reason why you're doing that is uh, in cases where uh, time is of the essence uh, and the patient is actually at risk of, say, vomiting or some type of aspiration. And so you want to make sure to perform the, the procedure uh, as fast as possible. And so one of the things that you're going to be doing is certainly you will have some deep sedation and muscle paralysis that will occur in order to try and expedite the intubation. Uh, you will be performing a pre-oxygenation of the patient uh, in order to try and like saturate the patient to make sure that they have like a reservoir of oxygen built in uh, so that that will give you more time to accurately perform the procedure. And certainly if there are some problems that are taking place or the procedure is taking longer than, than you expected due to a, a difficult airway, um, you can actually go back and start to, to, uh, to ventilate the, 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 the patient between tries. Um, but certainly if, if you do that uh, initially, at least that gives you a good amount of, of, uh, of oxygen within the, the patient's body in the hopes that you will be able to perform the procedure without uh, further delay. Generally, when you are uh, performing pre-oxygenation, you will want to administer um, a fraction of inspired oxygen for about uh, three minutes at 100% in the form of a non-rebreather mask, um, or you can end up having the patient take uh, usually about four or five out of capacity breaths at 100% fraction of inspired oxygen. Um, other than that, uh, you also want to make sure that, you know, if the patient is apneic, right, uh, there is going to be ventilatory support between intubation attempts. Again, if you notice that, you know what, you failed, you weren't able to actually go in there and intubate the patient the first time, what you will have to do is you're going to have to go back and you're going to have to be uh, ventilating them uh, before you end up trying again. And certainly at that point, you can end up doing bag valve mask ventilation in conjunction with a little bit of a cricoid pressure that's actually placed right around the cricoid area in terms of, say, uh, compressing the esophagus and preventing any air from actually going into the actual stomach. All right. Let's go ahead and continue here. We do have some of the pre-medication drugs. Uh, again, atropine, lidocaine, fentanyl, depending on uh, whichever drug you will be using in the, in the ER. Um, again, premedication in this case is referring to drugs that are given about three to five minutes prior to sedation, uh, and their primary uh, role is to try and decrease the sympathetic response. Anytime that you're going to end up manipulating the, the larynx or the entire airway, you're going to end up triggering a sympathetic response, hypertension, um, tachycardia, maybe even a bronchospasm. You don't want any of those things to be taking place um, before you're going to intubate a patient. And so you can go ahead, you can give them this medication, um, and hopefully that will actually end up preventing a lot of these effects from occurring. Let's go ahead and continue. Induction agents. These are going to be agents that will be given in order to produce a sedation. Um, and these drugs are usually given through a rapid intravenous push. And mind you, notice what, what they say, right? Intravenous push. So that means that IV access should already be present before you... Uh, you will you consider doing any of these maneuvers. Again, the medications that you will be using are etomidate, theopental, uh, ketamine, and propofol. Each of these have their, their own uses. Paralytic agents. Now, in this case, you're going to be given the paralytic agent after sedation occurs. Um, 
you will be applying cricoid pressure this time to, again, reduce the risk of a uh, gastric uh, aspiration. And you normally want to be given paralytic agents for one specific reason. Paralytic agents are actually going to make the muscles of the laryngeal airway floppy. They're essentially going to be flaccid at that point. And so because they're not going to tense up when you actually insert that tube, the hope is that you end up preventing any type of uh, laryngeal airway damage or tracheal damage from occurring. Uh, in addition, it should just make it easier for the airway to actually slide through. Succinylcholine is certainly one of the medications that can be used along with vericonium and rocuronium. Okay. Some indications. When is it that you would want to go ahead and intubate a patient? Well, certainly when someone is in respiratory or in cardiopulmonary arrest. Definitely, right? If they aren't breathing, they're probably going to need some type of intubation, right, in order to make sure that you can adequately ventilate them. Um, if there is a severe exacerbation of a chronic medical condition, basically you're, you're thinking about any unstable patients here. That will actually be another indication for uh, intubation. Um, certainly it in, in this case, I believe it does tell you that if, if you don't have any type of, say, ventilation, uh, you can end up uh, developing, say, hypoxia, or the or, or concurrently, you can also end up developing hypercarbia, right, and increasing the amount of carbon dioxide in the body. In either case, both of those conditions are bad, so you want to make sure that you're adequately ventilating the patient. Um, another reason why you would want to do that is in case the muscles are actually fatigued or there's some type of neurological dysfunction that is preventing adequate stimulation of the, the muscles around the, the respiratory airways. Um, or some type of airway obstruction. Perhaps there's a foreign body in there that is preventing you know, the, the air from actually reaching the lungs. Uh, in that case, yeah, you, you may actually have to go in there and intubate the patient or perform some type of alternative form of, of, uh, of, uh, of intubation. Trauma, certainly another reason why you'd want to do uh, an endotracheal intubation, specifically in the, in the case of, say, someone with a Glasgow coma scale of less than or equal to eight, uh, any type of injury or, say, airway compromise to the neck. Um, again, you know, any of these things are actually going to be uh, causes for wanting to intubate the patient to making sure that you secure that airway. Again, further indications, certainly flail chest is definitely uh, another reason. Um, any pulmonary injury that results in poor oxygenation or ventilation, multi-system trauma, right? Say they were in a car accident and they have multiple injuries to, to various organ systems, respiratory, uh, cardiovascular, endocrine, um, you know, GI. At, at that point in time, you're probably going to need a, uh, an, an airway because uh, the patient is unstable simply due to the amount of injuries that they've suffered. Loss of airway protection, probably due to altered mental status. Again, uh, it could be due because of, a, of say, a medical condition such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, maybe late stage Parkinson's as well, any other type of, of, uh, of, 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 uh, of disorder that affects the neurological system. Uh, intoxication is certainly something else that can end up causing an altered mental status along with sepsis, certainly. Um, anticipated clinical course. You know, let's assume that you have a, a medical condition that is rapidly, um, you know, rapidly failing a, a patient that is actually looking as if they're they're not going to be able to adequately sustain ventilation on their own, uh, leading to respiratory failure. In that case, you may just want to go ahead and intubate them in preparation of that occurring, um, or if they're going to have a surgery, right? Some type of a major surgery. Um, Perhaps, you know, some, some open heart surgery, a cabbage, gastric bypass, maybe some type of a, a hip replacement. All of these are major surgeries, and you're probably going to want to have that airway secured uh, just in preparation because of, of, of what the patient is going to be going through throughout the surgery and in terms of recovery period after the surgery. Inhalation thermal injuries. Recall that if you have inhalation thermal injuries, say from a, a fire, the fire tends to, to cause uh, the air to actually be very hot and dry. And so when you breathe in that air, it actually causes damage to the mucosa uh, all, all throughout the, the entire airway. Uh, and so in that case, yes, you're probably going to want to make sure to, to have in a, an intubation. Chemical injury is something very similar to, say, uh, what, what occurs during a burn injury. Uh, again, you're going to definitely want to make sure to secure that airway with, with probably an intubation. And finally, lastly, anyone who's having an increased... Uh, uh, difficulty in terms of breathing or fatigue, um, or if you have to transfer a patient to another facility with any of the aforementioned conditions. Okay, airway assessment of an intubation. You want to make sure that when you're assessing a, a patient, 
um, you want to make sure to kind of look at the body habitus. Is this patient actually, um, is the patient obese? Is they, are they short? Are they tall? Do they have a large neck, large tongue? Um, all of this is actually going to be important in terms of how difficult it's actually going to be to go in and actually intubate the patient. Someone who is shorter, uh, an obese individual, someone who's very has a large neck, it's going to make it a lot harder to actually have a successful intubation. Uh, again, make sure that you recall that in, in someone who has a very sh short neck, um, the larynx is actually going to be a little bit anterior. It's actually going to be a little bit superior as well. Um, so the axes that you're trying to align, generally the the, the oral cavity, the pharyngeal cavity, and the tracheal cavity that you're trying to align in that, that kind of a straight line will be a little bit more difficult to, to obtain in an individual like this. And so it's not impossible, it just requires a little bit more work. Again, someone who has very large teeth, um, large tongue, uh, a small jaw as well, uh, or say, say like a, a small mouth as well, if the, the opening is very small, they have a very small mouth, a small jaw, see like micronapia, um, large tongue or large teeth, any of that is going to make it difficult in order to accurately place that endotracheal tube. Um, and so again, make sure that you all are observant of this whenever you're going to be intubating someone. Make note um, that again, if there's a, an inability to, to open the mouth more than three centimeters, um, this will again will end up leading to less room and place to maneuver the equipment within the mouth. Remember, it's not just the tube that you're placing in there. You have to use the laryngoscope to try and obtain uh, some movement of the tongue so that you can gain access to that glottis. Uh, and so if, if the mouth can't be open more than three centimeters or so, it's, it's going to make it a lot tougher to actually visualize that glottis. Any trauma, blood or debris or, or vomitus. Maybe the individual was involved in a, a severe car accident. You know, they, they rolled over several times. They might have pieces of, of bone in their mouth. You know, they're probably bleeding inside, have some blood clots. Um, you know, who knows? I mean, maybe there's a, uh, you know, some kind of a rock or foreign body as well within in, in their mouth. All of these things can end up obscuring uh, a lot of the landmarks. You may not be able to visualize the, the epiglottis. Um, the retinoid cartilages. Um, and so we, just being able to see the glottis may be difficult enough. Again, something to consider. And finally, uh, ankylosing arthritis um, or a cervical collar, or, or you know what, any type of, of, um, of difficulty in cervical range of motion. If you notice the cervical range of motion is also diminished, all of these things together make it very difficult in terms of trying to, to obtain the axes in a in, in a straight line position. And so in those cases, you may want to consider an alternative form of intubation, uh, maybe some kind of nasotracheal intubation, uh, some type of fiber optic intubation, retrograde intubation, maybe even a cricothyrotomy. Again, this is something that you'll have to do on a case-by-case -case basis in the emergency room. Contraindications. There's a few relative contraindications, um, no absolute ones, but it basically involves an unstable cervical spine fracture. If you do have an unstable cervical spine fracture, um, it's not really an absolute contraindication in, in the sense that if it's required in order to save that, that patient's life. That said, though, you have to be aware that if you do have some kind of cervical spine fracture, you're always worried that any type of manipulation may end up causing damage to the spinal cord. So you're kind of between a rock and a hard place, right? How is it that, that you should go about this? Well, one of the things that we would do in the ER occasionally is, is actually use a fiber optic um, laryngoscopy. So it's actually a fiber optic tube with a laryngoscope, and that actually allows you to go ahead and manipulate the actual opening without having to move the, 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 the cervical spine um, in in, in, in a large amount of, of, of distance in any direction. Essentially, you're trying to decrease the amount of distance that you are manipulating the cervical spine, just because, again, you don't want to go ahead and, and do further damage to the patient. Uh, and so that is actually an option. You can end up doing fiber optic uh, laryngoscopy. Another relative contraindication that we actually just talked about is severe facial trauma. Um, again, if there's a lot of debris and blood that's present, it might end up making it difficult to visualize those vocal cords. Something that can be considered is a cricothyrotomy, albeit perhaps you can actually end up using suction or if you have um, McGill forceps, you can actually go in there and maybe remove some of the foreign bodies that are present. Again, this is all based on whether or not you have time. 
if time is of the essence and you need to put that tube in uh, immediately, then you may not be able to do this. You just have to do a cricothyrotomy. But if you do have some time, then perhaps you can actually end up removing some of that foreign body or you know a lot of that, that material debris that's actually within the, the oral cavity. And perhaps that allows you to be able to visualize the glottis. Okay, complications. Well, one of the things that happens is you're taking a tube and you're taking that tube and you're inserting it in through the mouth into the glottis, right? Okay, so let's assume that you do get it into the glottis. If you notice, it's going to have a beveled edge, so it's kind of cut at an angle. So it's a little bit pointy. If you keep on pushing the tube in there, one of the things that can end up happening is you can actually end up perforating. Um, you can actually end up perforating the trachea. That's actually one thing that can occur. Um, so again, because it's kind of pointy, you have to make sure that you know you're not kind of pushing it too far in. And number two, one of the the complications that can occur is, you know, depending on how that's actually angled in there, you can end up causing perforation of the trachea. Another thing that can happen is when you're going in and you're pushing the endotracheal tube in there, what will happen is, you know, sometimes it's kind of tight or there's a lot of inflammation around that area. You can potentially end up causing some damage. Um, and so you can end up causing some, some damage to say like the vocal cords. Um, usually it's, it's transitory, but sometimes it can end up lasting a lot longer. Um, and so that, that is certainly a possibility as well. So you can end up having some vocal cord trauma. Other than that, right, you may end up pushing that endotracheal tube too far into the, the actual trachea. And so recall that you want to kind of leave about three to seven centimeters of distance between the, the tip of the endotracheal tube and the carina of the trachea. If you keep on pushing it downwards, recall that you're, the right main bronchus is usually more vertical so it's kind of there more at an acute angle. And the diameter of the right main bronchus is usually a little bit wider, which means that if you keep on going, it's a possibility that you could end up intubating the right main bronchus rather than the trachea. So usually you have to go back and you have to pull it out a little bit. Um, again, this is why confirmation of the tube is very important. So why you have to go ahead and you have to auscultate the both axillas and the esophagus in order to make sure that you have the, the two placed in, in the right position. Not only that, but sometimes you actually go in there and you actually have to go ahead and manipulate it uh, just to make sure that you have it in the right area. Again, you always want to confirm that it is in the right area by eventually getting a chest radiograph. All right. Something else that is uh, important is esophageal intubation. Okay, so recall that the esophagus is actually adjacent to the trachea. So if you didn't intubate the, the trachea, perhaps you actually got it into the esophagus. And in that case, the concern is that you're going to be filling up the, the stomach with air. You're going to have gastric insufflation taking place. So if you end up doing that, you fill up the, the stomach with, with air, you can end up causing the, the, the patient to actually start to vomit you know, because of that. So you, you always want to make sure that you do have the, the tube placed in the right direction. Okay, let's go ahead and continue. Oral trauma as well, right? Recall that you're going to end up using a laryngoscope with a blade that's present. I'll be demonstrating this during the video. And so when you end up placing that laryngoscope and the blade into the patient's mouth, I mean, it, it tends to be a piece of metal that's in there, guys. And so if you're not manipulating it correctly, in some cases, even if you are, you'll still end up causing some damage to the teeth, maybe the gums, potentially the soft palate, hard palate, certainly other areas within the entire um, oral cavity. And so again, oral trauma is a possibility. All right. Uh, tracheal perforation of the stylet, I believe we did talk about that. Uh, aspiration, uh, certainly another complication that can end up occurring um, when you end up uh, applying positive pressure with a back valve mask. Uh, it can end up leading to, to gastric distension. And so usually what you end up doing is you'll put pressure along the cricoid cartilage, right? And that'll end up compressing the esophagus, preventing any, any type of uh, increase in, uh, in, uh, in air into the stomach. Um, what else? Pneumothorax, certainly another possibility that can occur with positive uh, pressure ventilation, um, especially And especially if the patient has poor lung compliance uh, or if the, the endotracheal tube is actually placed in the right main stem bronchus, which we did cover a little bit earlier. And finally, arrhythmias. Recall that we are going to be using some uh, medications that can potentially end up causing arrhythmias. Um, and any type of, of manipulation of the oropharynx as well will can end up uh, potentially causing a, a sympathetic response. 
And so uh, again, you want to make sure that you know you the the medication that you are using. You want to make sure that you are aware of a lot of the the adverse effects that can occur uh, when you are using the medications. Okay, pediatric considerations. I do have a quick slide on this. Uh, make sure that the that you are checking checking both the vital signs on children as well, but be aware that in children, even when they're decompensating, um, they may look like they're they're actually you know essentially in a stable state when in actuality they're not. Uh, and so you have to make sure to quickly be observing them in case there's any grunting, any nasal flaring, uh, you know, any retractions that are taking place. Uh, this is all actually going to indicate, uh, you know, a respiratory status in a pediatric patient. In adults, certainly vital signs can gradually deteriorate. Uh, and so it at least gives you a little bit more time to kind of uh, prepare that endotracheal uh, intubation. But in children, you do have to look for all of these other signs as well. If the child does require intubation, again, you have to make sure to pre-oxygenate them. Um, because of their, their smaller size, they, they can't actually handle longer periods of time without oxygen. And so if they're not breathing, then you have to make sure that you pre-oxygenate them well and go ahead and you try that attempt once. If it doesn't work, you have to go back to ventilating them. Um, again, they, they cannot go through as long of a period of time as an adult can. Okay, pediatric considerations in anatomy, especially more for say like a, a neonate, um, you know, maybe for toddlers as well. Recall that they do have larger head sizes. Though you do have to take take that into consideration as well whenever you're trying to put them into the sniffing position, uh, where the sniffing position is, where the patient's head is essentially in a cervical flexion, usually at about 30 degrees, and their head is actually forward. And so what that does, it's going to actually end up aligning the axes. Again, I'll try to demonstrate this during the, the actual demonstration video. So one thing that you can end up doing because of that difference in the child's head and the, the occiput uh, in, in terms of size comparison to the rest of their body is you can end up placing a towel or a roll underneath their shoulders in order to, to help them extend their neck. This is actually something that we do in some obese individuals as well and other patients. We'll just take a whole bunch of towels, place it underneath their head in terms of trying to elevate the head to the, the right level. Uh, again, child's tongue, usually a little bit larger. So something that you need, need to take into consideration. Um, and the larynx is a little more proximal uh, than it is compared to an adult. Um, so again, just make sure that you're taking all of this into consideration. There are two blades that are used, and I did put in a couple slides on that as well. Usually it's the MAC blade, which tends to be curved, and the Miller blade, which is usually a little bit straighter. The MAC blade is actually used in order to indirectly elevate the, the epiglottis. You usually place it right along the vollicula, and then you basically push up and out uh, and that indirectly causes the epiglottis to actually be flapped open. The Miller blade is a little bit different. The Miller blade is straight. And so what you actually do is you actually try to get the very tip of the Miller blade to kind of get the edge of the, of the epiglottis. So what you're trying to do is as long as you can get the very edge of it, you can directly manipulate the epiglottis opening. And so that way you can directly visualize the epiglottis. So the MAC blade results in an indirect um, in, in indirect epiglottal uh, movement, whereas the Miller blade results in direct manipulation of epiglottis in order to visualize the glottis. Regardless of, of whatever technique that you use, both into visualizing the, the, the glottis, uh, but we do tend to use Miller blades more commonly in children. All right. I will say one more thing. The reason why we do that is because in children, the epiglottis isn't quite as fully developed, and so it's usually a little bit more floppy. And so because of that, it's really just a lot easier to go ahead and directly grab it with the Miller blade and just move it up. Okay, post-procedure considerations. Um, once the ET tube has been placed, and again, I will be discussing the procedure in a, a separate video during the demonstration, but once you do have the ET tube that's placed, you're generally going to make sure it's confirmed in the right position. Usually you end up getting that chest X-ray. Uh, you've already gone in and auscultated both sides and, and, the, epi, and the epigastric region. And so you want to make sure to secure that. There's a few commercial devices that can be used, like an anchoring device, I think. Um, usually we just tend to use tape. So we'll take uh, some pieces of tape. We'll end up uh, usually wrapping it around the, the patient's uh, lips. And we'll end up securing it usually along the side of, of, the, of the lip without end up applying any pressure to the lips. 
right? So it's usually going to be adjacent to the side of the lip without applying any pressure to it. I'll try to demonstrate this as well during the, the actual intubation video. Ventilator settings are going to be established, right? You're going to make sure that you end up attaching a ventilator to the, the actual endotracheal tube, and you're going to end up uh, setting it to certain settings, uh, adjusting the tidal volume, the rate, the pressure, and the oxygen concentration. Um, again, you do have several different modes here, support and control modes. Um, and depending on the, the type of ventilators that you end up doing, uh, some of them are more automatic. And so you can end up just kind of setting a certain ventilation rate and the machine will actually take care of it on its own. Again, I won't be covering too much of this, just kind of again, probably going to give you all a brief overview. Okay. Ventilator settings, you can see the tidal volume, respiratory rate, positive and expir expiratory pressure, and the fraction of inspired oxygen here. Uh, for tidal volume, you do want to make sure that you're not going to end up risking any type of uh, barotrauma or ventilator-induced lung injury. So you do want to make sure that you, you have uh, the adequate tidal volume rate set at about 6 uh, to 8 milliliters per kilogram. Respiratory rate, generally you want to make sure that you have it set to about 100 milliliters uh, per kilogram. Um, when, it, when, uh, when you are adjusting that respiratory rate, keep in mind that depending on what the, the patient's status is, if they are febrile or if they are certainly in, in some kind of, uh, uh, say, systemic uh, in, in inflammatory, uh, you know, some type of systemic inflammatory disease or, you know, some type of systemic inflammatory condition at this time, they do have some kind of a fever, they may end up producing a lot more carbon dioxide. And so in that case, you may end up requiring a, uh, an increased respiratory rate to remove the buildup in carbon dioxide that they have in their bodies, All right? Again, you can see positive expiratory pressure here, usually with a, a valve that's going to be present. Um, and in this case, that's usually set at about five to 10 uh, uh, centimeters of, uh, of water. Let's go ahead and continue. By the way, the fraction of inspired oxygen usually is at about 100%, uh, but it can be rapidly titrated down depending on what their oxygen saturation level is. Okay, ventilator modes, you can see the pressure support here and the pressure regulated volume control. Guys, these two are just going to be different types of, uh, of modes that you all can end up setting the ventilators. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail on each of these, uh, other than that you normally end up just setting the previous values that we set. And depending on the type of ventilator, the machine will end up taking it, uh, taking care of it for you. All right. Um, let's go ahead and continue. Again, the same type of thing. There's different types of ventilation modes that you do have here. Okay, some of the, 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 the equipment that's going to be used for endotracheal intubation. I'll be actually demonstrating this during the video. I just wanted to place this picture here just so you could see some of the equipment. I will not be demonstrating all of this equipment during the video. Uh, we do have, it looks like some oropharyngeal airways. These are actually called Goodell airways. It looks like a small one. This is a large one. This is a, looks like a nasogastric tube here. It's probably a carbon dioxide monitor in this case, a Yankauer suction uh, tube, McGill forceps that are present here, tracheal light. Uh, let's see here. This looks like it is a bougie over here around this area. Over here, you end up having your endotracheal tube along with the syringe. This is a Mac Macintosh blade right here, a uh, Miller blade right here, and the laryngoscope handle along with a, a mask. We're not going to be using all of these, but certainly these are some of the other components that you can end up having as a backup in case your endotracheal tube fails. You may end up having to use some of this other equipment uh, to try and see if you can obtain a successful attempt in the future. Um, but uh, Again, you're not going to be using all of this equipment, but I just want, wanted you all to see some of the other pieces of equipment that you will likely end up having uh, probably on your cart as well. Okay, pediatric intubation equipment. You all can see a lot of the same equipment that's present. Um, some scissors, forceps, tapes that are present, along with some tincture as well, manometer. Um, this is, again, some of the same type of uh, equipment that we end up using uh, in an adult. I just wanted you all to see at least some of the other uh, type of equipment that we use for PEDS. And finally, some of the oxygen masks that are also presently used. Okay, laryngoscope blades. You will notice that you do have, again, the Macintosh blade, the Miller blade. You can end up seeing that cross-section that's present over here. 
you will notice that you do have all of the different sizes that are present. So you have a Macintosh blade. They usually go from zero to four. For the Miller blade, they start off at double zero, and then they go all the way to four. I will make a quick note, there is a pattern here. If you notice, size zero is identical for both the Macintosh and the Miller blades. So if you can know the actual sizes for the Macintosh blades, you really know the sizes for the Miller blades as well. So it usually goes from largest to smallest, size four all the way to uh, zero. It's usually going to be large adult, small to medium adult. It's going to be a child. Um, after that, it's going to be an infant. And then you're going to end up having a neonate. And then for the Miller, you do have that special double zero terminology. And that one's actually used for the premature. Okay. After this point in time, I did want to show you all at least a little bit of the carbon dioxide detector. Um, again, the gold standard is actually a uh, waveform capnography or some type of uh, carbon dioxide monitor that actually visualizes how much carbon dioxide is actually present. Um, but again, if that is not present, you can actually end up using this carbon dioxide detector. In this case, what you'll notice is that it's going to end up changing a certain color. So if carbon dioxide ends up um, being detected, you will notice that it's going to change into a yellowish color. All right. Lastly, this is the procedure. And so this is actually going to be the procedure that I'm probably going to be following during the demonstration. Um, I did just want to go ahead and include it. And this procedure is directly from your book, which is why you do have some, uh, some portions of the steps that actually allude to certain video uh, figures uh, and tables that are actually found. This is directly from your book, and I will be trying to follow this as close as possible during the demonstration video. Hi there. So in front of you, I have laid out a lot of the equipment that we will be using for the endotracheal intubation. Uh, we will be starting off discussing a lot of the specific pieces of equipment. Gradually, I'll work my way rightwards and I'll discuss a little bit on the model that we'll be using to simulate the endotracheal intubation. And I'll go ahead and I'll actually discuss a little bit in terms of how to use the bag valve mask. So we can go ahead and begin. We can start focusing on some of the equipment that we have here. Uh, along this side, uh, specifically this part right here, we have one of the blades. This is actually called a Mac blade. Underneath it, on this side, you do have a straight blade, which is also called a Miller blade. You will recall from your book that usually the sizes tend to range from zero to four, with the Miller blade actually having a double zero uh, blade, if I recall. And so the sizes actually increase in terms of what you're gonna be using for usually uh, children uh, and, and adults. And so if you're gonna be using uh, a blade primarily for an adult you want to use a four blade you want to use a blade for a, um, a medium or a smaller adult a three blade a two blade will be used in a child uh, generally a one blade will be used in an infant and after that you're probably going to be using a, a zero blade probably for a neonate okay now the next thing that we're going to be using you will notice that you have handles that are actually here these handles actually are important because they're going to have some batteries and they actually if I take the blade and the handle, you can go ahead and you can actually connect them. And as soon as I connect them and make a 90 degree angle, you might be able to see that there is a light. This is important. Whenever you're gonna be using any piece of equipment, you wanna make sure that they turn on. And so if they don't turn on, there's two things you can do. Number one, you can switch the blade, or number two, you can actually end up changing out the batteries in the hope that it will actually turn on. You wanna make sure to actually do the same thing for your backup blade that I have over here. Let's go ahead and attach it. Go ahead and click it, and you should be able to see that there is a light shining. Again, if it does not shine, go ahead and switch the, the blade or change out the batteries on the handle. Another piece of equipment that we do have is over here. That is called the endotracheal tube. Now, let's see if I can actually change it over here so that you can see at least some of the numbers. You should be able to see that it says 6.5 here. That's usually the size of the endotracheal tube. Over here, you can see some other numbers, usually in centimeters, and that gives you the distance that the endotracheal tube has traveled within the trachea, all right? Other than that, I do have this piece of equipment right here. This is actually called a stylet, and it allows it, it gives it a little bit more rigidity whenever you're placing it within the trachea. Other than that, I do have a 10 milliliter syringe. Now, what else is important? Well, we already tested out the, the handles and the blades to make sure that they turn on. Now you wanna make sure that the cuff, which is over here, also ends up inflating. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this syringe, I'm gonna go ahead and I'll pull out the plunger. 
I'm going to end up connecting it to the valve that's over here. And now I'm going to depress the plunger and you should see that the cuff kind of inflates like a little balloon. Okay, at this point in time, you want to go ahead and remove the syringe from the valve to test to make sure that the cuff stays inflated. Remember, whenever you place this endotracheal tube within the trachea, you want to make sure to form a tight seal. And if this cuff, this balloon, doesn't actually inflate enough, you're going to end up having some air that's actually um, basically like leaking around the side of the endotracheal tube. So in this case, it looks like the cuff is actually staying inflated. And so you can go ahead and you can actually remove the air and deflate it. Now, what do you do if it doesn't actually stay inflated, if it actually deflates? At that point in time, you want to go ahead and get another endotracheal tube uh, to make sure that it is functioning appropriately. Some other things to note. Going back to this number right here, 6.5, this is actually the size of the endotracheal tube. What's important about that is that that size can vary. Um, you have sizes from about 2 all the way to 12, and in adults, you generally tend to use, in adult men, you generally tend to use 8 to 8.5. In adult women, you generally tend to use 7 to 7.5. But it is variable. Sometimes in a taller individual, you may have to end up using an endotracheal tube that's a little larger, maybe a 9 or a 10. In a shorter individual, that's 5 feet, 4 foot 11 or so, you may have to use an endotracheal tube that's a lot smaller. Again, you have to adapt accordingly. Of note, I also want to talk about one other thing. Generally, when you end up having the stylet in here, you may end up putting a small amount, and I, I will I make note of this, a very small amount, a light coating of lubricant to make sure that it smoothly goes into the endotracheal tube. Again, you don't want to make sure that there's globs of lubricant actually going in there. And the other thing is you want to make sure that the stylet doesn't really go past the bevel of the endotracheal tube. Again, you want to make sure that there's no puncture that's going on there. You want to make sure that it stays behind the bevel of the endotracheal tube. One other thing that can happen is if you need a little bit of lubricant, you can actually end up applying it to the cuff, which is right here. A very thin film can be applied to make sure that it actually passes through the vocal cords. All right. Beyond that, I will say that these blades that you have here are normally going to come in bags that are essentially sealed like this. Again, showing you all that you will be using sterile procedure when you are performing a, an endotracheal intubation. Let's go ahead and move over to the right-hand side. Over here uh, on this side of the table, we do have a model that's actually going to be used to, uh, to simulate your endotracheal intubation. You have an individual here, usually from the neck upwards. You have an open mouth. You can see some of the oral mucosa and some of the teeth. You also see the two lungs that are essentially shown right here, along with the stomach. Now, this is going to be important because you have to do something called pre-oxygenation. So, I have a bag valve mask that's right here. I will end up placing the mask over. Now, you will see that there's a pointy side and there's a dull side. The pointy side goes over the nose. The dull side goes over the mouth. And then you end up forming a C-shape with your thumb and your forefinger. And you use your bottom three fingers to go ahead and do a chin lift. Now, what you're going to end up doing when you're doing pre-oxygenation is you gently squeeze the bag. And you're going to be squeezing it approximately one time every six seconds for a rate of 10 breaths per minute. And generally, pre-oxygenation tends to occur uh, for about three minutes. Some books say three minutes to about five minutes in order to obtain adequate pre-oxygenation. You will notice that the entire bag does not need to be depressed. Whatever you can hold with your hand, as long as it depresses the bag by approximately one-third in volume, that is more than enough air that you can give to the individual. So I will do it one more time, and that should be about it. Okay, students. So just like any other procedure for endotracheal intubation, you want to make sure to identify both yourself and identify the patient. 
So in my case, my name is George Veda Jr. I'm a physician assistant here at the UTRGV Health Center. You wanna make sure to obtain the patient's date of birth and their name. Once you have confirmed that, you can go ahead and you can begin the rest of the process. So one of the things that you definitely wanna do is you wanna discuss your procedure with the patient. What are the indications, right? And so the indications for this procedure would be say some type of a thermal inhalation injury, uh, certainly some type of a chemical inhalation injury, an exacerbation of a chronic uh, respiratory condition such as bronchitis, chronic bronchitis or emphysema, uh, along with potentially pneumonitis or pneumonia. You can also think of many uh, of some type of uh, traumatic event that causes a Glasgow coma scale of less than or equal to eight. Uh, and certainly whether or not you have a Glasgow coma scale of less than or equal to eight, whether that be caused through trauma or through some type of sepsis, intoxication, inflammatory condition, uh, or drugs, whatever that may be, if it does meet that criteria, you can actually go ahead and you can actually uh, consider intubating that individual. Other than that though, the, uh, beyond that, you definitely want to discuss some of the benefits. And so the benefits of this procedure is of securing the airway. You definitely want to make sure to secure that airway because at that point you can go ahead and ventilate the patient so that they have adequate oxygenation uh, and removal of carbon dioxide. In terms of contraindications, uh, or in terms of relative contraindications, there's at least two of them that I can think of. The first one is some type of unstable cervical spinal injury. And so in that case, what you're thinking about is certainly uh, damage to the CNS. And so if there's an unstable cervical spine injury, perhaps the spinal cord might be transected or you might be making the, the, the case worse by moving around the, the neck area. Uh, that's usually uh, uh, discussed on a case-by-case -case basis with the rest of the clinicians, whether or not you definitely want to proceed with endotracheal intubation. Beyond that, certainly severe facial trauma. If the patient was in a car accident, uh, perhaps they were thrown out of their vehicle, and they have a, a lot of foreign bodies within their oral cavity, some type of uh, dust, some type of mud, dirt, uh, perhaps broken bones, or some kind of rocks, that may obscure the opening to the glottis, and so you may want to consider some type of alternative form of intubation. And alternative forms can take the form of, say, something such as uh, retrograde intubation, uh, certainly direct fibro optic uh, laryngoscopy is certainly another one, um, nasotracheal intubation, even a cricothyrotomy. That's usually something else that can be performed. There's several other forms, but again, those are alternative forms that may be considered if you cannot perform endotracheal intubation. Now, in terms of, say, um, some of the risk of not having this this procedure performed. The main, the main problem will be hypoxemia, which can eventually lead to death. And so those are the two that I can think of just off the top of my head. In terms of complications, well, you're going to be inserting a tube into the, the, the oral cavity. And so you have to consider about all the things that can be damaged. Well, you're going to be using a, laryng a, a, a laryngoscope inserting it into the mouth, and so you can end up damaging or potentially breaking the teeth, damaging certain soft tissue structures such as the hard palate, soft palate, even the tongue. Uh, beyond that, when you're inserting the, the actual uh, endotracheal tube, recall that it has to go through the vocal cords. And so when you insert it through the vocal cords, there's a potential of damaging the vocal cords. You can also end up having perforation of the trachea, along with if you keep inserting the, the endotracheal tube even further, potentially uh, intubating a bronchi. All right. Beyond that, you can also end up potentially intubating the esophagus, which is another uh, commonly uh, known thing that happens during this procedure. Other than that, some other things that I can think of that can occur would be some type of arrhythmia or hypertension that can occur with some of the medications administered during the, the, the pre-medication or during the, the neuro, neuromuscular blocker phase. All right. Now, once we've already established that, we've already discussed the procedure with the patient, what is it that you want to do? Well, you want to evaluate the, the patient, right, to find out whether or not they're a good candidate for intubation. What do you do? Just look at the patient, look at their body habitus. Are they short, are they tall, are they an obese individual? Focus in on the neck. Do they have a very thick neck? Or do they have a short neck? Look at their mouth, look at the dentition, look at their tongue. Is, is their teeth or are their teeth very large? Is the tongue very large? All of this is actually going to be important. Is the opening to the mouth sufficient enough so that you can insert the laryngoscope? So let's take this step by step. If you're gonna be looking at the, the mouth to begin with, look at the mouth and generally you tend to have about three centimeters or at least a minimum about three centimeters of opening in order to properly insert the laryngoscope and visualize the, the actual glottis. 
Beyond that, you're also going to be looking at the teeth to make sure that they're not very large. If they are very large, keep in mind you definitely want to look at the dentition to make sure that when you're manipulating the laryngoscope, you don't damage the teeth. And if you do, you want to make sure whether or not you caused that or whether that was something that was already present. The tongue, is it very thick? Are you going to actually be able to use the tongue sweeper and move it away from the midline to view the glottis? Lastly, you also want to make sure to look at their cervical mobility. Is the neck actually able to be flexed enough so that it can be in cervical flexion with a little bit of extension so that it can be in the proper sniffing position? All of this is certainly going to be important. And beyond that, certainly the neck as well, just to give you an idea as to how large that proximal portion of the trachea and the larynx is. Once you have already done that, then you're going to assemble all of your equipment, which I already have over here on this table. I already tested it out by uh, inflating the cuff and I have my backup Miller uh, laryngoscope along with the Mac laryngoscope that I will be using. Both of them are functional and the lights do turn on allowing me to visualize the glottis. Okay, at this point in time the patient will be laying down in a supine position. They will already be flexed, certainly, or they should be flexed in the what's called the the sniffing position which is where you end up having the, the patient in about 30 degrees with the neck flexed. If the patient cannot end up obtaining that position uh, properly either with the bed, you can actually end up using either some pillows or some uh, shul some towels to actually place underneath the occiput in order to place them in the proper position. In children, you may actually have to place some towels underneath their upper back and shoulder in order to place them in the proper sniffing position. Okay. Now, what else is it that you're going to want to do? Well, the patient should already have intravenous access at this point for administration of pre-medication, um, certainly for uh, sedatives, and certainly for neuromuscular agents. They should also have uh, proper um, vitals measuring devices attached to them, including a blood pressure cuff, pulse oximetry, and usually an EKG to monitor their heart rate. This should already have been done ahead of time. For you, you also want to make sure to wash your hands, and which I already did. You want to make sure to have your proper gloves and the rest of your PPE present, such as a mask, uh, certainly a gown as well, in order to perform this procedure. Again, we will be using a sterile procedure. Now, what you want to do at this point, once the patient is already in a supine position, in the, the, the sniffing position, you want to make sure to take a bag valve mask. You want to make sure to, in this case I'm using my left hand, use what's called a C shape. And so you're going to be using your thumb and your forefinger to apply pressure over both the nasal and oral cavities. My three bottom three fingers are actually going to be tilting the chin. And and I'm going to be using my right hand to go ahead and administer one breath every six seconds. And it should be a nice and smooth motion. This should give you a rate of approximately 10 breaths per minute for approximately three minutes. Now I will go ahead and stop it here, assuming it's already been three minutes. At this point, you want to go ahead and start endotracheal intubation. You generally want to do it within 30 seconds. If you have not done it within 30 seconds, you will go ahead and you will have to restart. So I have my laryngoscope in my left hand. I will go ahead and I will insert it along the right hand side of the oral cavity. I will use the tongue sweeper to go ahead and move the tongue away from the midline. And I will place the MAC blade along the vallecula. I will also be using my forearm to go ahead and try to displace the epiglottis upward so that I can view the glottis. Now at this point in time, I'm not sure if the camera can see, you should be able to see the glottis. There are vocal cords located along the lateral side, usually white colored, along with the arytenoid cartilages, which are along the posterior side. I will go ahead and I will take the endotracheal tube with my right hand and I will insert it along the right hand side of the oral cavity. I will go ahead and I will visually see it passing through the vocal cords. Once it has passed through the vocal cords, I will go ahead and I will remove the laryngoscope without letting go of the endotracheal tube. At this point in time, I will go ahead and I will remove the stylus. I will continue pressing the endotracheal tube until I'm at about 22 centimeters. I will go ahead and with my left hand, 
go ahead and inflate the cuff and without letting go of the endotracheal tube, remove it. My assistant will go ahead and place the bag valve mask on it, give several breaths, and you should see chest rise, the first thing. You will also be auscultating along the mid axillary line, along the left and right hand side, to auscultate breath sounds. In addition, you will also be auscultating along the epigastric region to make certain that you have not uh, intubated the esophagus. And so in this case, it looks like it is properly intubated. So here, I can hear breath sounds on both sides. I check the abdomen. I don't hear anything in this area, the epigastric area. Now, once that has been confirmed, the next thing that we will do is we'll go ahead and we can remove this and place a mechanical ventilator. But before that, you want to make sure to properly secure the endotracheal tube. Professor Bias will go ahead and remove the back dog mask. There we go. And so you will end up taking pieces of tape and making sure to go ahead and secure it along the right-hand side of the oral cavity without it ever actually touching the lips to prevent any type of necrosis. You usually end up placing two strips along this side, two strips along this side, just to make sure that it's nice and secure. After that point, you go ahead and discard the materials, give proper post-procedure instructions, uh, including placing the mechanical ventilator on top of the actual endotracheal tube, making sure that it's in the appropriate um, oxygen uh, pressure, oxygen rate, and the ventilation rate. And that is it. Now considering that the patient is awake now, we can go ahead and discuss some further post-procedure instructions uh, involving uh, hoarseness and sore throat that can uh, develop as a part of the intubation procedure. Um, you can also end up uh, telling the patient to return to clinic if they have any hemoptysis, um, or they have coughing or difficulty breathing in order to, to further evaluate, just in case there was you know, some type of uh, difficulty that occurred during the intubation process.